you want to start us off? All right. Welcome everyone to Experiential Learning and Food Studies. Uh, my name is Dr. Scott Morris. And, I, uh, oh, sorry. I'm, and I'm Dr. Kira Lovell. Uh, we are both professors at the University of Utah, specifically at the Asia campus in Incheon, Korea. Uh, and I'm a writing and rhetoric professor. And I am a professor of history. And then I also teach courses in uh, gender studies and other humanities courses like this one. And that is pictures of us that the students made for a project <laughs> that we will talk about. All right, so like I mentioned, we're at the University of Utah Asia campus. Um, and so in order to understand the context of the class that we'll be talking about, it's important to understand the dynamics of the campus we're at. Uh, we are a satellite campus of the University of Utah. Um, all of our students, like when they graduate, it does not say Asia campus on their diploma, it says University of Utah. Um, we are located in Incheon, Korea, which is on the coast of Korea, just west of Seoul. Um, our students are mostly Korean, about 90%, I would say. So they're trying to increase that number, uh, pulling students both from the US to come, as well as um, recruiting, especially from other uh, East Asian countries. And um, all of our students have to go to the main campus eventually. They have to do at least uh, two semesters on the main campus in order to get their degree. Um, but for many students, it's their first time in a Western style education. A lot of our students are coming from Korean high schools, uh, which have a very different educational approach than um, our Western style approach that's more conversational. And, um, and that's a big shock for a lot of our students who, who come here. Perfect. Let me tell you about the course. Um, it We've taught the course twice now, um, two different times or two different versions. So the first time that we taught it, it was an intensive two and a half week winter course in which the course was every single day, three hours a day. We've also taught it twice a week for a full semester. Um, but in general, both times it's been hybrid. It's a first year level elective and we've had anywhere from 12 students to more than 20 students. Um, we've held it via Zoom, uh, but as when we're doing our in-person um, activities, we've chosen multi-purpose rooms versus a classroom, which I think is really good as far as I think it automatically um, shapes your mind to want to think more creatively and more socially in a way that uh, a lot of our classrooms, were, which are a bit sterile, do not. We have Korean and non-Korean students, but we want to center our course on accessibility for ESL learners, English as a second language learners. Um, so for example, two of our texts that we had, the first one is Uma's Table, which is a graphic memoir of a Korean man who, um, it's his experience in which he is starting his own family uh, at the same time that his elderly parents are uh, moving on. And so he uses food, memories of food as a way to talk about different relationships with his family, different memories that he has. Um, and so what is really great about the book is that not only does it um, take into account a lot of different food experiences from gardening, from breastfeeding to alcoholism, but it's also a graphic memoir in which there is not a ton of text, but you can really get the sort of emotional dimension through images. Um, in addition, one of the things that uh, ways in which we targeted or made it more accessible to ESL learners is that one of our textbooks was the Atlas of Food about global food systems. Uh, and we did a divide and conquer strategy in which we broke the students into groups uh, and made them responsible for those chapters and learning and teaching about those chapters. And that way they could teach it to the other students. So we tried to make, um, even though we're covering a wide variety of topics, we can't sign. Uh, assign a ton of reading. And so we're trying to think of different strategies that we can still get the same amount of uh, coverage um, with less reading time for our ESL students. Uh, we also use Google Drive to make almost all the work, not the grades accessible for, for students to peer review for group work and building community. Um, this was uh, 
a little bit confusing when we're doing grades, but it's really helpful in getting students to look at other student work, um, especially since we did a lot of project based uh, assignments, which we're going to talk about later. Um, overall, the focus was on exposure versus mastery for us as well as the students. Uh, and then finally, our whole goal in the course was just that to make sure that students realize that food is multifaceted and relevant, that it's not just an unnecessary accessory to their day that maybe they don't think about that, but the realization that it is uh, in fact part of every part of their day and their lives. So building off of that idea that um, this class was exposure versus mastery, it was a, you know, a freshman level course. It is the, the curriculum that we get from the main campus is not necessarily food studies, but it was designed to be just a wide exposure to many aspects of the humanities. And we picked food studies as the basis for our class. Um, but with that, we brought in something that I've been doing in my writing classes for a while called labor-based grading. Um, this comes from a writer named Inoue um, who developed labor-based grading as a way to reward labor and not necessarily to punish imperfection. Uh, which sometimes we are guilty of in academia. Um, and the basics behind this, and I am oversimplifying this for the point of a brief conversation, uh, is that the, we don't give any grades on any assignment. Every assignment is just complete or incomplete. Um, they're unweighted. Every, uh, the idea being that every hour of work is the same as any other hour of work, no matter what it is that you are specifically working on. Um, and this whole system is designed to encourage risk taking um, and it also allows for failure. Uh, I put failure in quotes there because the whole idea behind labor based grading is that if you are working, you are learning. Uh, and sometimes that work isn't successful. Like you, you may, it was your first time ever doing professional food photography, you are not an expert at it, but you did try several of the techniques we asked you to. Um, you, we can, you can report back and say, here's where I did this thing you asked. And I can, as a professor can say, well, it's not as effective because of these, two, these reasons, but you still tried it. Uh, you can tell me that you tried it. You're aware of what the concept is. Um, and so labor-based grading is an excellent system for experiential learning because it allows students to engage with difficult concepts without feeling like they'll be punished if they don't fully grasp all of them. Um, and especially because our class was designed to cover a bunch of the humanities. Um, and we didn't have a lot of time to linger on like, we're gonna focus on economics. It's like, we're gonna do one day on economics and then we're moving on. Um, and so, um, you know, with the rapid fire nature of the many topics we covered, it's especially rewarding to say, you tried it, you may or may not have succeeded, but it was the engagement that was most important. And with that, translates to, in case you're curious about how they actually get grades, um, is there is a system by which they're allowed a certain number of incompletes or late or missed assignments, uh, and those affect their grades in certain ways. Uh, and then there's extra credit assignments that can boost their grade up to an A, or um, if they fall, fall behind, they can do extra credit, um, which we don't have time to get to here, but we'd be happy to talk with you more about. Yes, and to plug that, we are publishing this in the journal as part of the conference, so you can read more about any of these topics in our article that will be in there. Okay, interdisciplinary approach. Um, so it's a team talk course in which we took advantage of the strengths and interests of both of our, um, our of the faculty. So my strength and interest is more in uh, history, cultural studies, uh, and Scott's is more in writing, rhetoric, creative writing, especially. Um, and so I think that what we began with the class is is knowing uh, or is being able to meet at the table and say, this is what I really want to do, uh, and I'll take advantage of that. Um, so, for example, um, Scott uh, let, led in both of the classes a sort of multi benchmark restaurant review assignment, which the students really like, especially because of COVID and we can't eat together, um, even when we did have some food um, food experiences we had to send students 
away and be like, go eat this food and then come back in a few minutes and tell us about it. So the restaurant review assignment allowed students to eat together as a group and then uh, conduct restaurant reviews. But it's many different uh, steps in the process like that versus something that I really wanted to bring to the table, which is Uma's table, because I really love assigning graphic history and graphic memoirs. And so my take on Uma's table, which was which was much more about an emotional read of the memoir um, rather than necessarily creative writing. So we both tried to bring our own interests um, and celebrate those with the students as well. So we tried our best to tailor to our majors and minors at UAC. We don't have that many majors and minors, so I think that we got a little bit lucky. Um, one of our biggest ones is film. We also have communication, urban ecology, writing and rhetoric, and game design. Uh, and so we really tried to make, not only highlight those, but try and make connections between them and some of the projects that you're gonna hear about. Uh, we also use a variety of interdisciplinary texts across the humanities. So we had academic readings, we had journal articles, we used podcasts as homework assignments, we had narrative film, and we also had documentaries that we had the students watch to really try and give them a palette of different ways in which um, different fields are exploring food. We also relied on non-UAC guest speakers, which was really important to me because we didn't want another, because our university is really small, um, I'm not exactly sure how many faculty we have, but I know that we only have, we have less than 500 students. Uh, and so I didn't want another professor coming in to tell them like, oh, hey, I'm going to have you in an hour, but let's talk about this. I wanted to show them different uh, people, different people on our campus, since we share a campus with a couple of other universities, such as George Mason University uh, and SUNY Korea. So we wanted to bring some professors in from there, as well as other uh, specialists that are local. So a couple that we did are um, this at the top right, we have a professor, Jared Brune, who came, who's a game design professor at George Mason Korea. And he worked with us both semesters in talking about uh, different food games and how you design a game, uh, especially the rule set, which is what he's talking about here. So it was really fantastic, especially since a lot of our students are really interested in game design. Um, and I think that they don't always think through that. How do we communicate it clearly? So it was really, really helpful. Uh, and then finally at the bottom, which we're gonna talk about a little bit more later, is we had a food photographer come in. Um, and what was really cool about it is that not only did he work with the students, which you're gonna see some of their work, but he was very specific about in photography, this is my gear, um, this is how I take photos, this is what um, tech, like the technical specifics of photography, which I think was really helpful, especially for our film students. I know that of all the guest speakers that we had, the most amount of questions that students asked were in this workshop, which was surprising to me. But we're also uh, interested in other future ideas. For example, we have someone on campus that's an expert in cheese making, also building connections with other uh, universities that teach ecology at SUNY Korea. So we're open to really building more relationships that are not only interdisciplinary, but collaborative. So moving more, um, talking more about that with the various projects, um, we've already mentioned that this course was very much uh, experiential learning, and it was very much a project-based course. Um, we would kind of pick several big benchmark projects and then either have small ones that led directly to it or just that were in the same vein, getting students to be thinking about that, um, that, that sub particular subject that we were on. Um, we used a lot of group work. We told students at the beginning, this is a very group work heavy class. If you're not comfortable working in groups, it's probably not the uh, class for you. But we also rotated groups a lot. Each project, we had a different group, some of them randomly assigned, some of them ones where they could pick their own partners. Uh, but we also had uh, lots of individual projects as well. Um, and it's just important to remember that every, especially within the labor-based grading where everything is complete or incomplete, we always had a very clear list of here is what you must do and what you must accomplish in order to get it complete. Um, and we'll talk more about that later as well. Uh, and we were also very interested in immersive learning experiences. So uh, we, we went big on projects. Uh, we really tried to get students to really engage with the ideas. Um, and we also, as much as possible, which was not always possible, but as much as possible, we tried to pair our project with the guest speakers. Um, so the picture you see here 
is from the Food Photography Day. So after we had the professional photographer give a spiel about his career, um, at both his techniques and also what it's like to be a creative, the students were asked to take pictures uh, and we provided them with a chicken sandwich and we gave each different group a theme to think about in terms of advertising um, and how would you take this uh, photo for um, a specific type of advertisement. This group that I'm showing you, their theme was romantic. So they were trying to take a romantic picture. Um, can you click the slide? So oh, here is the picture that they came up with. Um, we were blown away uh, and they used many of the techniques that the food photographer had talked about. Uh, but just, it is the most romantic picture of a chicken sandwich I have ever seen. <laughs> and I, it was also the most successful out of all the groups at really nailing the mood that they had been assigned, thinking about food and advertising and food and media, as well as just the specifications of being a photographer. Um, and we had similar things with board games. Uh, we all took a trip to a farm together. We had cooking lessons from someone who uh, cooks both for her family, but also sells her food kind of locally in the community. Um, and we had student services come and talk about the food pantry that we have on campus for students. Uh, and our students did a project related to most of these things or very closely related to those things. So um, it was really successful in that way, really getting students hands on, not just reading about things, but being made to engage with and try to produce projects that shows their understanding of the concept. Okay, so we have um, local, different perspectives from local to transnational food. Um, but I would argue that we began with personal. So why personal? Because I think sometimes in academia, we, or especially in my field in history, we're so resistant to the idea of students making the content personal, of like, keep I, me out of it. Uh, and we really began the course with the personal. So why personal? Um, the context of Korean education is important to think about because there is no personal in the context of Korean education. A lot of the students, especially since this is a first year course, are coming straight from a Korean high school um, or Korean public education. And they are taught that there is one correct answer and that um, the correct style of learning is a what they call like a banking method of the of the teacher professor um, deposits information into your brain and account and you just need to relay that back to them. And that is not how we teach at all. And so we began the course with a little bit more um, simple assignments that just wanted to encourage students to play, take risks, have fun. Um, one of those that I'm going to show you right now, um, which hopefully you can hear. I'm not sure if we have the sound shared. Um, but it is our assignment in which, uh, so our students, one of their interests in which um, uh, I, I pull students on, on what are they gonna do with their future careers and things like that. And many of them respond that they want to be famous on YouTube. Um, it's not a nonsensical idea in Korea. And in fact, like technology, video game design, YouTube, these are all like, top industries here in Korea. And so one fun assignment that we did is we listened to podcasts and we did readings on asthma, uh, on, do you actually know what that stands, stands for, Scott? I don't. I, I can't remember either. <laughs> but <laughs> anyway, asthma of um, the concept that you would uh, break down uh, and experience into sounds and really focus on sound and the sensory experience of sound. This is especially important for us because at this point, we are very isolated because of COVID in both semesters at the beginning, we have, um, and then we were on uh, online only, I believe. And so this was a really fun experience in which you might feel lonely in your dorm room or it might feel lonely if you're studying abroad and you're away from home. Um, and so instead of feeling lonely, try and play with your food and record it and then share with us about that experience and we can talk through it. But this is an example of one of the best ones that we had by Jay. I can't hear it. Oh, you can't hear him? Mm -mm. Should you share it or should I just keep going? Let me see if I share it, if that will help. Okay, it's worth it for the sound. Yeah. 
Okay, let me share my screen. Sorry, y'all. Oh, no worries. Wrong thing. I tell. We still can't hear it. Mm -mm. Oh, I have another thing. So when you sh click share screen, did you click that? Oh, click sound. Yeah, you're right. You are right. That is. It's funny how like teaching on Zoom for I've years. <laughs> oh, really? I'm still teaching on Zoom. Stop it there. Jay is so great and he was so funny. And um, I think what's important is that a lot of our students did not want to like play with their food. Like I even had one student tell me that um, their parents were like watching them and, and they were telling them like, okay, but well, you're going to eat that. Like you're not going to waste food. Uh, and so I was trying to tell them like, it's your assignment, like play with your food, waste food. Uh, but really trying to set up the context of like this class makes you take risks and we want you to play and explore different angles of food. Um, okay. The next thing we did was we, uh, if, why is it personal is we wanted them to create conversations within their own community and report back. Uh, one example of this was UAC recipes. Can you click on this slide? Okay, perfect. So we did what you can see here is the cover of a cookbook that we collectively made in which students had to conduct uh, rest, uh, interviews on a recipe from someone um, that was either on campus or a family member or something like that. But as Scott was talking about for extra credit, you needed to do extra work. And one of the extra work assignments was that they had to interview another student about how they make a recipe, but that it had to be done at the convenience store. So Korea is runs on convenience stores. And in fact, all of our students pretty much live off a microwave. And so I didn't want to create an environment in which only certain recipes are accepted. I wanted to sort of capture this moment in college in which they're living out of our local convenience store on campus and the microwave. Um, so they had to interview a friend and do a step-by-step -step process of how they tailor different foods at the convenience store. Um, so that's one example. Can you go back for me, Scott? Okay, perfect. Uh, in addition, I wanted them to celebrate their own love of Korean food, just like you saw there um, with those recipes, but they also had a comfort foods essay uh, and an oral history interview project in which we just let them explore foods that were really important to them. Uh, and they turned out like really personal, uh, I would say in some cases, like intimate moments with food uh, and memories that they had. Um, in addition, we wanted to focus on how the local is transnational. So different, uh, what are the experiences of global, local experiences of global foods? For example, um, we had, which I think you're going to talk about, is on the last slide about coffee. Is that right? Okay, perfect. So Scott's going to talk about coffee. Another one that we had is we had a whole mini unit on ramen, um, which is interesting because Korea is one of the highest importers of ramen in the world. And so for this unit, we watched Tampopo, which is a really famous movie on ramen. Uh, they were divided into groups and read and um, taught different chapters on the history of ramen. And then we also had a sort of ramen buffet in which they could make their own ramen. We couldn't actually sit next to one another to eat, uh, but it was really great because this became for me the influence for the recipe cookbook in which they would do the convenience store challenge because I learned from all the students, they are very picky about how they eat the ramen, which they call ramyeon. And so that means that they need to microwave it for a certain amount of seconds. They need to add cheese. They need to add like in, things in a certain order. Um, and they were very particular about it. And so I, I wanted to celebrate those uh, intricacies about ramen. 
And so finally, we wanted to create opportunities to challenge the idea of Korea as homogenous, which is definitely the stereotype here. Um, and so as uh, Scott already mentioned, uh, we went to Barefoot Gardens and did a um, uh, sort of uh, a gardening trip. But I think what was really cool about it is that the gardener, the farmer there is from Texas, uh, Korean American from Texas. And so he was able to talk about how the different peppers that he brings from the US and how he integrates them into Korean barbecue here, um, as well as uh, with Chaithinya, who taught our Indian cooking class. And we talked with her about the different ingredients and how food tastes different here because of her access to different ingredients versus when she's home in India. So those are some different examples of how we really wanted to connect the personal with the trans national. Uh, so all of this brings us back to our conclusions uh, about what that might mean for whatever classes you are teaching. Um, first was that because we were teaching this during COVID, because we had very strict rules about when we were allowed to meet together and when we were together, how our classrooms had to be set up, um, we had to get a lot of permissions for us to be able to meet together at all. To, and like, like uh, Kira said, we couldn't even eat in the same room. We had to send students out to eat. Um, anyway, so we had to be very flexible. And there were a lot of things that were like, we are going to do it this way if we're allowed to meet in person and we'll do it this other way if we're not. But it also opened up a lot of um, opportunities. So the picture here, we did an Airbnb experience as a class and we got a lecture from a coffee grower in Mexico but we worked with a local coffee distributor here to get samples of coffee for the students to taste test. Um, so, you know, it, it posed some challenges, but we were able to create still some great learning opportunities, even being, uh, even doing this all entirely in isolation. Um, and with, um, you know, going back to the labor-based grading and um, the experiential learning, just like, the challenges of COVID-19 and hybrid learning, um, the assignments also, we gave students boundaries, but outside of that, it was um, lots of uh, things that, you know, they, they had lots of room for creativity. And I just realized you were gonna talk about that now. Oh, that's okay. You did a way better job than me. <laughs> um, okay, next we had, um... I think that one of our strengths and maybe even is a, a reality of um, the capitalist academic system is that uh, we needed to promote this class and in turn we developed a relationship with our university PR so that they could promote this class as a way to promote the university and using this class as an example of western style education Now, this is going to be very different depending on what your campus is and where you are in your context but I think um, the uh, food studies and interdisciplinary, interdisciplinary collaborative courses like this, I think are what many universities are looking for. Um, and, and it's really compelling um, uh, types of education. And so I think I would suggest that if there's ways in which you can build relationships with university PR um, to promote your course, I think that it will help you in the long run. Second of which the reality is this course is so project-based that we heavily relied on department funds. Um, we hadn't used course fees up to this point, but when we teach it again in the fall, we'll have to use course fees. Um, I think it makes for an incredible experience. I think it's totally worth it, but understanding your own context of if students can afford it or um, if it is going to be an obstacle in your department, I think is also a reality that you have to negotiate. Um, and definitely when we, were, um, when we were planning the first iteration of the course, and COVID was starting to look better at that point, um, we were developing different projects. Like we really wanted to do um, a cooking challenge in which all the students were working in groups and they had the same amount of ingredients and they were gonna need to make different recipes. And that was scrapped. There were so many things that we had to because of COVID scrap, which also impacted how much things cost uh, and different things like that. So just realizing that this all comes with price. Um, it, finally, I would say that student engagement was the success. So 
we didn't in thinking about um, you know the quantity uh, quality over quantity we really just wanted to create opportunities in which students were engaged uh, in which if they were um, playing and having fun if they were talking if they were creating um, uh, interesting material if they were just asking questions to the guest lecturers we just wanted to create a uh, platform in which students could engage with the community around them. And then finally, our area for improvement is definitely quantity over quality as far as it is really, really hard to cover a lot of different topics, even though we really want to uh, as an interdisciplinary humanities class. Uh, but I think that what we in teaching the course twice have learned is that you just like the students, you have to take risks. And so we have a lot of ideas like the final line I have there is result is our yes and a very sort of like, oh, yeah, that's really great. Let's try this next time or let's do this. Uh, and so some assignments that we really love are just not working well. Um, and it's not that they're failures. It's just that we know that we could do a little bit better on something else. So I think just as the expectation that you would have for your students of them being open to creativity, uh, challenging boundaries, taking risks, I think you have to do that as faculty members as well, which I think is all sort of indicative of the new present of uh, education. Any final thoughts, Scott, or should we? I think that's it. Thank you all. Yes, thank you all. And definitely check out our article that's going to be in the proceedings of this conference. So thank you so much. Yay.